Well then, time to check out the masterpiece that is Rings of Power Episode 6. This one has been extremely well received, at least relative to episodes 1 to 5, so let's see if that praise was warranted. We continue our tale of woe by joining Adar and his army. He addresses his orcs by telling them that they have endured much, having cast off their shackles and travelled across Middle-earth. He makes clear his intent to attack Osterith and also provides a hint of his overall motivation. Some of us will fall. For the first time, we do so. Not as unnamed slaves in faraway lands, but as brothers. As brothers and sisters in our home! This is interesting as it means the orcs are seemingly motivated by a desire to have their own part of Middle-earth that they can call home. My understanding was that orcs were just evil by virtue of the fact that they are orcs, but Rings of Power has decided that they are instead just like any other race of Middle-earth and that they just want a spot to settle down in. Even without drawing reference to either the books or the Peter Jackson movies, this does not mesh at all with how Rings of Power has depicted orcs thus far. They are without exception sadistic, violent monsters, and yet the show is apparently trying to add a degree of moral complexity to them? I like moral complexity in fantasy or sci-fi shows as much as anyone, but I simply don't trust that the writers of Rings of Power are going to be able to pull this off. They haven't yet made this explicit, but for now they've just hinted at it, so I won't explore this further yet, although I will assume that this will be expanded on by the end of the season. Adar states that tonight they will close their fist around these lands, which given his intent to attack Osterith, all but confirms that the only humans in the Southlands are the ones currently in Osterith, and the ones that defected in episode 5. This means that, as I had suspected, Every remaining human settlement did indeed travel to Osterith for reasons that were not explained except for in the specific case of Tirharad, who evacuated because Bronwyn found an orc head. This means that Adar is aware of this fact, and even if he is able to confirm that every single village in the Southlands is deserted by using the apparently extensive tunnel network that the orcs have dug, he can't know that they are all in Osterith. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. I assume that the reason he is attacking now is because he has confirmed that the evil sword is in Osterith, and that was the only reason why he had not enacted this plan sooner. This was not mentioned in this scene, but Adar was made aware of the location of the evil sword in a previous episode. Waldreg then asks Adar what happened to Sauron, but he does not get an answer. The orcs having now entered Osterith declare it to be abandoned, but Adar says he knows that the elf, referring to Arendir, is still in Osterith because he can smell him. And wouldn't you know it, Arendir then pokes his head up and starts mowing down orcs left and right because I guess none of them brought any bows. This also means that, as Arendir is a god with a bow and arrow, he had the element of surprise, and he knows that Adar is their leader, he could very well have assassinated him then and there. And as it turns out, he didn't actually need to reveal himself, period, because of what he does next. We then come to the Watchtower. Oh, Watchtower, when I saw you in episode 5, I was expecting to be criticizing how they had only just realized that you exist. I was expecting them to light a beacon so as to inform the other Watchtowers and eventually the elven military that shit is going down in the Southlands. I was going to criticize that the Southlanders should have done this on day fucking one. But I was not prepared for what they were actually going to do with you, dear Watchtower. So, Arendir ignites an arrow and fires it into a bracket winch type mechanism on the Watchtower. It breaks, and the entire tower disintegrates and crushes the orc army. They were unable to escape because Arendir locked the door by doing this. And we then see that the Southlanders made it to the bottom of the hill and are cheering at the defeat of the orcs. How they managed to get past the orcs who were coming from precisely that location is indeed a mystery. Honestly, at this point, the absurdity of this show seems pretty self-evident, but here we go. The Watchtower disintegrating after taking a single arrow is ridiculous because it has apparently stood for thousands of years and is presumably not made of paper. There is no way Arendir could have known that the Watchtower would fall specifically in the required direction. If the plan was to destroy Osterith, then this could have been done without Arendir revealing himself in the way that he did, thus putting the entire plan at risk for no reason. Additionally, given their plan, pinning everything on just Arendir and Arendir alone is incredibly risky. Additionally, if their plan was to destroy Osterith, why not just destroy the bridge? That would mean that they can stay inside a very well fortified position whilst presumably firing at the orcs with bows and or spears. Additionally, the Southlanders evidently decided that the best way to defeat the orcs was to lure them into their own castle and then blow it up, meaning that the Southlanders are now just adrift in the wastelands behind enemy lines, 
when they could have been inside a goddamned elven military garrison. Given that now the Southlanders have decided in fact to abandon Ostrith, they could just keep going. I know they should have done this days ago, or weeks, because I have no idea how the chronology works in this show, but right now they should just run. My guess is that there are still orcs in the Southlands, but as the show has not made this clear in the slightest, and as we have just seen Adar's army get apparently wiped out by one guy, and as the Southlanders are now congregating in a wide open space with torches while shouting and cheering, the show is either trying to communicate that the orcs are dead, or at the very least severely weakened, or it is communicating that the Southlanders are retarded. I know that there are more orcs. You know that there are more orcs. But apparently no one else does. Bronwyn, who is in charge, if you recall, tells the Southlanders that they must make ready the village. I do know why they are making ready the village, but I'm going to criticize that when the time comes. Okay, so Aaron Deer has stanky B.O. Bronwyn is still in charge. And Adar wants the orcs to have a home. We then cut to the Numenorean fleet, which consists fantastically of three ships, and we see Isildur tending to the horses. We can see that there are ten horses on this ship. Ten times three boats equals thirty horses. I wonder how many they will have later. Ah, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, it is worth highlighting here that the show is explicitly telling me that they have thirty horses, which causes problems even if I don't jump ahead. Firstly, is Isildur's horse Beric just that goddamn boss of a horse that he gets recruited from all of Numenor to be one of the thirty that gets to go to war? One would think an actual war horse that doesn't belong to some spoiled kid might be a better alternative, but the Numenoreans do not have any kind of military presence. See my breakdown of part five for more info on that. So maybe Beric was in fact one of the only thirty horses on Numenor. Unless Elendil made Beric get recruited in order to teach Isildur a lesson. Oh god, that sounds mildly interesting and could maybe inject some much needed cocaine into this show. But unfortunately, as Elendil decided that Isildur had in fact earned his place in the army in episode five, this wouldn't function. Damn. We almost had something there. Isildur wanders on deck and encounters Galadriel, who is still wearing her full suit of armor. I was totally fine with her wearing it at the end of episode 5. It gives her a degree of authority and awe, and not only does it make sense for her character to want to do this, but it also makes sense for the Numenorians to want her to do this. But this scene suggests that Galadriel is in fact wearing her suit of armor for at least some of the month-long sail across the ocean to get to Middle-earth. In fact, from what we can tell, she has been wearing this suit of armor for the entire trip, as she has been wearing it on both of the two occasions in which we have seen her on this boat. This, as if it needs saying, is incredibly dangerous, because if she gets knocked overboard she will sink and drown. I know that she believes that she can swim thousands of miles of open ocean with no supplies over what would take nearly a hundred days if she swam non-stop, but although she apparently doesn't need food, water, or sleep to survive, I think it's reasonable to assume that she at least needs to breathe. Anyway, she tells Isildur that he will be able to see Middle-earth in a few moments. I, I was only- Hoping to get the first sight of land. It'll be visible to your eyes in a few moments. And I was hoping they would kind of leave this here, to subtly imply and reinforce that elves have better eyesight than humans, but oh no. Isildur then says, Oh man, your eyes are really good. And then Galadriel says, Indeed, but they haven't seen you before. Clunky dialogue is sure as shit clunky dialogue. This eyesight discussion is steered in the direction of Galadriel acknowledging that Isildur is a noob as she has not seen him sailing or training, which might suggest that he shouldn't fucking be here. Evidently Galadriel doesn't have any idea who his father is. Isildur says that his rank is that of a stable sweep, which tells us a few things. Firstly, it means that Isildur is not a soldier who was just kind of ordered to clean up after the horses. It means that he is in fact only here to clean up horse shit. This means that Elendil was convinced enough by Isildur apparently saving Kemen from that dastardly mystery arsonist from episode 5, who could it have been, that he was willing to let Isildur come along and clean stables while the real men go off and fight, but was not sufficiently convinced to actually let Isildur be a soldier. And I very much have a hard time accepting that Isildur would be okay with this in the slightest, especially given that he specifically wanted to come because he wanted to do something he deemed worthy of Numenor. My guess is that in the last five minutes I have spent more time thinking about this than anyone involved in the production of the show did, and that I should not care about the whys or the hows and instead prepare myself for the inevitable big hero moment which is facilitated by Isildur being on this boat. Anyway, Galadriel tells Isildur, Despise not the labor which humbles the heart which is a solid piece of advice, but one that is absolutely laughable coming from Galadriel, who demonstrates in quite literally every scene that she is in that she is as far from being humble as Elendil is from being part of the Scooby-Doo gang. Galadriel continues. 
Humility has saved entire kingdoms, the proud of all but led to ruin. Suggesting that she specifically values humility over pridefulness, even though Galadriel is pridefulness incarnate. And Isildur then tells Galadriel that he joined the army in order to... I was just trying to get away. What? Wait, what? But I thought... I thought you were going west. Not till I've done something worthy of Numenor. So was he lying to Elendil? Not that I would put this past him, Isildur is a swindly little prick, but this does in fact mean that he just wanted to get away from Numenor. I was just trying to get away, as far as I could from that place. Numenor? It's not Numenor. Not the real Numenor anyway. This expands a little on his original motivation for wanting to leave the Sea Guard. If we assume that Isildur is being truthful, he dropped out of the Sea Guard in order to leave what he considers to not be the real Numenor, hence him wanting to go west. And now he has joined the army as a shit shoveler in order to leave what he considers to not be the real Numenor, but he is now heading east. Quite far east, actually, like thousands of miles east, into hostile territory. Why couldn't he have just gone to West Numenor like he originally said he wanted? Uh, sorry guys, I'm doing that thing again where I'm thinking critically about character decisions when what I should be doing is drooling like a disabled dog and clapping like a seal because gosh darn it I am so happy to be back in Middle Earth again. We then learn what happened to Isildur's mother and Elendil's wife. She drowned. The sea is always right! The sea is always right! <laughs> there are many ways that people can die. They can die in childbirth. They can get stabbed, they can bang their head, they can get set on fire, they can get eaten by wolves, the list goes on. What Rings of Power has just done, and I hope to fucking god that this was an accident, is have one character who believes deeply that the sea is always right, tell another character who is wearing a full suit of armor whilst at sea, and presumably unaware of the inherent drowning risk that this poses, that his wife died because she drowned in the sea. Like, did Elendil come home without his wife one day, and then Isilda was like, hey dad, where's mum? And then Elendil just said, C is always right. And then didn't elaborate further? They could have picked any other way for her to have died. They quite obviously don't care at all about the source material. So just say that she tripped and fell on her own shears. At least then we don't have to work out the mental gymnastics involved with Elendil believing the C to always be right when the C killed his wife. And the irony of him telling Galadriel this whilst she is oblivious to the inherent risk of sinking that comes with wearing a full suit of armor at sea. Elendil then informs the Queen Regent that once they reach the shore, they will sail up the river for a day, and then they will need to ride for a day in order to enter the Southlands. He mentions that they need to go into the mountains, which raises some questions as to how they will manage to cross the mountains in a day with horses and supplies and with everyone geared up for battle. Ah, don't worry about it. It will happen off screen, so who cares that it doesn't make sense? Okay, so Galadriel is vain as she wears her ornate armor every day whilst crossing the ocean, but also values humility and dislikes pridefulness. And Elendil believes the sea to always be right, even though the sea killed his wife. We then see Arendir hammering the evil sword, and it appears to be pretty indestructible. He then says that he must hide it, as he can't destroy it, but that no one else can know just in case. Particularly you, Bronwyn, in case you flip on a dime and decide to be evil again. We then see the villagers setting up traps and sharpening their weapons. I mean, they could just leave. The orcs can apparently only travel at night, so they shouldn't catch you. Anyway, Arendir then tells the people that their position gives them an advantage. I will wait and see, but right now I'm just thinking whatever advantage this village gives you would have been tenfold had you just stayed put in Osterith. The Southlanders decided to destroy their fortified position in favor of defending themselves in a town that can quite literally be attacked from all directions. I guess that's what happens when you elect a woman- uh, sorry, I mean, I guess that's what happens when you elect an incompetent leader. Yeah, let's, let's go with that. Anyway, the villagers appear to be home aloneing the shit out of their village, and Arendir says that they must wait until every last orc is in the village before they spring their attack. Bronwyn says that they will barricade all who cannot fight inside the tavern. This can't possibly go wrong. Arendir continues to offer words of inspiration, which I quite like. He definitely comes across as far more believable in his authority than Bronwyn. Theo then asks what he will do, and Bronwyn tells him he will be in the tavern. Theo states that the tavern is for the wounded and the children, because I guess saying women and children would be inappropriate for 2022. Uh, oh, sorry. No, I mean it would be inappropriate for a medieval inspired fantasy world because this peasant culture is apparently up to speed on modern day diversity and equality training. Anyway, Bronwyn acknowledges that Theo can fight, but says that this is why he must remain in the tavern to protect those 
those who cannot. Essentially, this is an exact retread of Eowyn at Helm's Deep. If, however, Theo were at Helm's Deep, he would indeed be fighting. There were children younger than him being torn from their families for this exact purpose. But hey, we can't have a woman do the babysitting. That would be so regressive. I'll try my best to leave this here because I really don't want to get bogged down in comparing societally enforced roles for men and women. Because even though I find this a bit ridiculous, it isn't directly a criticism of the show, so I will move past it. Theo stays behind because Bronwyn says so. She then reassures Theo after he asks her to. When I used to have bad dreams, do you remember what you used to say when you would hold me in the dark? Would you say it to me now? In the end. This shadow is but a small and passing thing. There is light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. Find the light and the shadow will not find you. This doesn't really seem like something you would say to a child, but apart from that, this mostly works for me as an isolated scene. Theo shows himself to be more vulnerable than he lets on, and Bronwyn actually fulfills her role of a mother for once, which is nice. Bronwyn then herself asks for words of encouragement from Arendir, also revealing herself to be more vulnerable than she lets on. Why couldn't we have had more of this? This is starting to actually flesh out Bronwyn as a character. Give us an unimposing young woman who finds herself responsible for a group of villagers and she doesn't feel up to the task but perseveres by giving off strong woman energy, but in the background she is very much struggling and vulnerable herself because she was not prepared for what this responsibility entails. Give us that instead of this. This tower will no longer be a reminder of our frailty, but a symbol of our strength. <laughs> Who among you will stand and fight? Pretty pathetic, huh? Arendir continues that after the battle they will live together and plant trees in their garden, a reference I assume to him having been a grower before becoming a soldier, and this is also notable for being the same seeds that Bronwyn had given him when we first saw them in episode 1. Then they kiss for what I assume is the first time, and the sun sets. Okay, so this scene is, apart from the very first Southlands scene which introduced these characters, in my view, the best scene we have had in this story. Apart from the absurdity of how and why they are in Tirharad at this moment, if we assume that what they are doing by home alone their village before nightfall is in fact the best thing to do, or even anything other than a retarded thing to do, the characters in this scene not only function, but we also learn about them. The smallest goddamn thing. And with one or two very slight exceptions, it has taken Rings of Power nearly six hours to get there. I just wish that we had previously had hints or references as to Bronwyn's insecurity as a reminder that yes, she is just in fact a girl, rather than a turbo badass who decapitates orcs because she is cool. Her characterization in this scene I do think is good, but unfortunately I do not think that it meshes with her previous scenes at all. Okay, Theo wants to fight and Bronwyn is protective of her son and is sometimes vulnerable. Well, night has fallen. I wonder if the orcs will remember that they have a tunnel going directly under Bronwyn's house. Wait, if the orcs have a tunnel going directly under Bronwyn's house, then why did they wait for nightfall? And why did the Southlanders not booby trap that tunnel? Anyway, let's move on for now and see what happens. All right, that's a lot of orcs. I guess we have no idea how many there are. Is the Southlands just kind of full of them? Gonna reference Game of Thrones here, and yes, even the bad seasons, to make this point. We never saw or understood the White Walkers and Whites' true numbers until they attacked Winterfell. We did see large numbers of them in a few scenes, notably during the massacre at Hardhome, but they were constantly referenced as this insurmountable and almost infinite enemy. This established that even though we never actually saw how many there were, we just had to go with lots. They were a constant, unseen threat that was known by the characters and the audience to be vastly numerous and thus incredibly dangerous. So, how is this comparable to the orcs in Rings of Power? Well, as in Game of Thrones, we have no idea how many of them there are. We have seen a few digging holes and we have got hints that there are more. We have seen Adar's army march towards Ostereth, get flattened, and we're now seeing hundreds more arriving at Tirharad. Point being, the show has not made clear how many orcs there are, but where Game of Thrones succeeded, Rings of Power has failed because the show itself has not acknowledged this. 
The White Walkers were recognized by the characters in Game of Thrones to be an infinitely multiplying threat repeatedly during the series and they were always a factor for concern even when they were not on screen and even though their exact numbers were never shown. This made them that much more terrifying. The Orcs in Rings of Power, however, just seemed to be respawning, and without any reference from any of the characters, I can only assume this was not the intent. If Arendir were to say, oh snap, there's so many more than I could have imagined, where are they coming from? Then problem solved. Anyway, whilst there is something of a twist to the nature of these orcs in particular, I find it rather amusing that for the second time, the orcs are just kind of walking directly into a trap. They're just kind of slowly walking into Tirharad going rather than applying any kind of strategy whatsoever. They know how to use bows, and yet they aren't setting up a perimeter. They aren't setting the buildings on fire with arrows. They aren't being sneaky. They aren't using the goddamn tunnel! We then see Bronwyn hiding behind a cart and trying to set it on fire. Uh, oh, oh, no, one single orc is coming to check it out for seemingly no reason. Maybe he is on his way to check out the house behind where Bronwyn currently is, but if so, why is there just one orc? There are hundreds of them, but I guess Bronwyn has to be able to overpower whatever they send her way, even though the orcs are apparently stronger than humans, and Bronwyn is a woman. Okay, so the orcs go to check behind the cart, and <gasps> she isn't there. Where could she be? Could she be off camera to the left, which would mean she is entirely visible to the hundreds of orcs walking past 20 feet away? You bet your ass she is. Remember guys, if it is off camera, it doesn't exist, which is either rule number two or number three of writing Rings of Power, I forget. <coughs> anyway, because apparently no one saw her, she yells and stabs the orc in the foot, leading to this poor woman getting her throat slit. I know she kinda just stood there and took it, but either way, Bronwyn just got this woman killed, and she will never be mentioned again. <coughs> Bronwyn didn't need to yell, and yet she yelled. Her intent was to do this without being noticed, which apparently worked, meaning there was no reason for her to yell. But yell she does, because I guess if we delete this other rando woman from existence, then there are less women to compete with Bronwyn, making her one step closer to being the ultimate girl boss. But apparently, none of the other orcs neither saw nor heard any of this, because Bronwyn is then able to defeat the orc in a 1v1, set the cart on fire, and cut the rope, thus activating the booby trap. It sure is lucky that only one single orc came to check this out. It sure is lucky that an orc came to check this out, period, because that was the only reason why Bronwyn was able to activate this trap in the first place. It sure is lucky that Bronwyn can 1v1 an orc. It sure is lucky that none of the other orcs saw nor heard any of this. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Anyway, she cuts the rope and the cart crashes into the bridge and cuts off their escape. In this shot here, we can see roughly how many orcs there are. Because it's dark, it's a little bit difficult to tell exactly, but I'll be generous and say that there are 50 orcs in Tiharad. Which begs the question of where the rest of them are. Then this happens. Okay, so these orcs are both deaf and blind. Apparently a flaming wheelbarrow rolling towards them at high speed is a stealth attack. Apparently the villagers also knew that this would happen. I'll be honest guys, so far the praise that episode 6 has received is very much a mystery to me. Anyway, now apparently trapped, the villagers and Arendir start firing at the orcs with their bows. Arendir nails a few, but the MVP is honestly this guy right here. Like holy shit this guy is good. Shame he doesn't hit any of the main characters. They're headed for the tavern! Because I guess the orcs know that the tavern is where the women and the children- it, it, Fuck, sorry guys, I'm not progressive enough. The wounded and children. We see that the orcs have this little diddly battering ram, which confirms that, yeah, had they stayed in Osterith and not destroyed it, then they would likely be fine. Or at the very least, they would last longer, and less people would have died. Which means whoever's idea it was to destroy Osterith is kind of responsible for everyone who gets killed in this scene. So far, Bronwyn has got that one woman killed for no reason, and two or three Southlanders have been nailed by arrows. Seems like a rather high risk plan, but what do I know? I'm just a hater on YouTube, or so I'm told. Anyway, then this happens. Oh wow, okay. So their master plan was to just run at the orcs who are wearing armor and poke them with sticks. Which means if there were more than about 50 orcs here, their plan would absolutely not work. But I guess they knew that there would only be 50? Also, pretty risky move to run at the orcs with sticks when you had a fucking castle, you cretins! Anyway, then this happens. Ah! 
All right, so maybe it is just Arendir who has really shitty hearing because this is the second time he has been snuck up on when he absolutely should not be. It is difficult for me to say exactly because I can't tell if this is a mistake or if this is intentional, which is always the mark of good writing. So, if we utterly disregard any and all other material that is not these six episodes of Rings of Power, we have been told that Elrond and Galadriel both have really, really good eyesight and that Arendir does not have really good hearing. My understanding was that all elves have really good eyesight and really good hearing, but from what we have been told, either elves just have good eyesight, or potentially that Arendir, as a bit of an anomaly, specifically does not have good hearing. Until they show me that he does in fact have excellent hearing, I can't be specific with this criticism, as it is either a direct contradiction or poorly communicated character information. So, Arendir and the orcs fall off the building, and instead of killing Arendir, this orc just kind of walks around for a bit and then gets stabbed. Plot armor is certainly effective. But then, oh snap, it's Big Chungus. <laughs> if only Big Chungus had a bow. Oh well. Time for the cool mini-boss fight. Given how goddamn loud this fucker is, I'm also not sure how he managed to sneak up on Arendir, but actually yeah, this makes it the third time he's been snuck up on. Maybe elves don't develop good hearing until they're 300 years old, I don't know. So yeah, they do a fight, which uh, looks superficially cool, but suffers from the cliché of the bad guy throws the good guy around a whole bunch when he could just kill him. This orc is significantly stronger than Arendir, and it could just snap his neck or tear him in half, but yeah, his plot armor continues to be excellent. Then Big Chungus bends Arendir over and fills him with his juices. <laughs> All right, I'll tell the whole truth. Big Chungus removes the stick from his eye and blood squirts out of his eye hole as if his eye is a major artery and squirts all over Arendir's face. Sorry guys, I am trying to keep this PG-13, but Big Chungus is making me hard- wait, shit, I mean- Alright, so upon having Big Chungus's eye goo pour all over him, he strangely does not close his mouth, and Big Chungus decides that he will kill Arendir by poking out his eye. Gandhi was wrong. 1,000 internet points for anyone who understands that reference. Anyway, all seems lost. Arendir is about to get poked, and he is then saved at the last minute by, to no one's surprise, Bronwyn. How she got here and how she knew to come here is anyone's guess, but actually I didn't say that because I was distracted by how cute of a couple they are. Aww. It's a shame that Arendir has just been deflowered by Big Chungus. Anywho... Wow, that was easy. So two flaming wheelbarrows, a handful of archers, and some guys with sticks, and you did it, boys, and strong independent women. You defeated the orcs and saved the Southlands. You vanquished the evil that Galadriel spent centuries trying to locate and defeat. Which is precisely what the show wants you to think, but as I have eyes and ears and some semi-functional grey matter in between them, I am apparently not the target audience for Rings of Power, and I know that there are a lot more than 50-odd orcs because you have shown them to me. Anyway, Arendir notices red blood on one of the corpses instead of the black blood of the orcs, and they are shocked to discover that a good number of the dead are in fact the defectors who left with Waldreg in episode 5. Not entirely sure why this is shocking, they knew that these people left and they knew exactly why. This orky boy then says, Had to pay the toll. Confound your lousy toll, troll. And then the remaining orcs who did not enter the village start pelting the villagers with arrows, including Bronwyn and the Cowgoo Man, nailing every hit, continuing to show fantastic aim when required. So, now that this twist has been revealed, let me go over the orcs' plan. They send the defectors alongside some orcs into Tirharad, presumably to die, but if they can get some killing done, then all the better. That way, the villagers will then reveal themselves and can then be turned into pincushions. Now, they could have skipped a step here and just marched in with every orc and killed everyone, but Adar presumably made the decision to send in the defectors first in order to thin the numbers and also cause the villagers to take a morale check. This suggests two things. Firstly, that Adar does not care at all for the lives of the defectors if their optimal use is to die and thus sow fear amongst the villagers. Secondly, Adar deliberately wants to sow fear amongst the villagers rather than just kill them. Whilst it does make sense for Adar to not want any pesky humies left at the end so he can create a home for the orcs, the only reason why the villagers were able to get pelted with arrows was because they were apparently unaware that Adar's army consisted of more than approximately 50 orcs, and therefore they were perfectly happy to stand around outside of cover. 
Instead of pelting them with arrows whilst the defectors were distracting them, the orcs waited until the villagers had thought they had won so as to provide the episode with a dramatic high followed by a dramatic low. Unfortunately, this does not function as intended, because we already know that Adar does not care whatsoever for the lives of the defectors, so there is no reason not to send in the defectors to distract the villagers and then just take off and nuke the entire site for Morbid. Also, if this was his plan, why did he not do this in Osterith? Adar believed the villagers to be in Osterith, so why didn't he march the defectors in first? Well, you see, if he had done that, then the defectors would have all died in Osterith, and thus there would have been no dramatic realization that the villagers have been killing their own people, which makes this an instance of characters being dumb and or inconsistent in order to facilitate drama. Okay, so Bronwyn yells at her enemies when attacking them quietly can apparently 1v1 an orc, and Adar employs fear tactics and employs military strategy so as to maximize drama in a TV show rather than to actually achieve his objective. Arandir is a boss with a bow, has bad hearing, was raped by Big Chungus. Rest in peace. Okay, so now the villagers are all inside the tavern and the orcs approach menacingly. Bronwyn tells Theo to help the Kalgu man first, presumably because he took a few arrows to the back, whereas she took one to the shoulder. Unfortunately, the Kalgu man is dead, which very much upsets Bronwyn. Rest in peace, Kalgu man. We knew you so well. Bronwyn then instructs Theo on how to stop the bleeding and thus save her life. I like that Bronwyn, established to be a medic, is the one who knows best how to stop the bleeding. This is exactly the time when this character should have authority, unlike virtually every other time when the show depicts her as having authority. They remove the arrow, but Bronwyn continues to bleed heavily. They then cauterize the wound after placing the seeds in the wounds. These seeds were established in episode 1 as being used to create a salve and therefore do presumably have some kind of healing properties. Whilst I like that these seeds are being used for multiple purposes in this story, I am unsure how ready I am to accept that they are able to save Bronwyn by cauterizing cauterizing the entry and exit wounds from an arrow. She will still be bleeding internally and severely, judging by the amount of blood. As we don't know exactly what these seeds do, however, and as I am feeling generous, I will accept this provided that they acknowledge that Bronwyn is indeed severely wounded. Throughout this scene, we also catch glimpses that the orcs are now right outside the tavern, so it sure was nice of them to not only wait for them to save Bronwyn, but also to not make any noise. So Bronwyn prioritizes the lives of her people over her own. Anyway, the orcs have now arrived, but for real this time, and Adar is with them. Again, there appear to be maybe 50 or so orcs, so how many are left in reserve this time, I still have no idea. They begin battering down the door, and time appears to be up for the Southlanders. But wait, what's that on the horizon? Well, it's the Numenorian army. Before continuing, their timely arrival raises more than a few questions that I assume will never be answered. Where did the extra 470 horses come from? This show explicitly showed us that they have 10 per boat. How did they know to arrive in Tirharad? All they had to go on was Halbrand saying where the orcs went next after destroying his village, which, given the distances involved, must have been at least three months prior. If we assume that Halbrand left his village, walked all the way across Middle-earth, jumped on a boat, and then encountered Galadriel, this would have taken, at minimum, a couple of months. Additionally, although the show did not communicate this due to the distances involved, it would have taken approximately a month for the Numenorians to reach the Southlands, plus the ten days training time established at the end of episode four, and this happened at at most two or three days after Galadriel and Halbrand arrived in Numenor. To track this onto the Southlands plot, we know that it takes maybe half a day to get from Tirharad to Osterith and about the same time to get from Tirharad to Horden. So, working backwards, the Southlanders have been at Osterith for a few days at most given that they ran out of food and had no means of acquiring more. Plus a day or so to get there. Plus a day or so for Bronwyn and Arendir to do their shenanigans in Horden. And they departed for Horden on the same day as when we first met them. This means, if my calculations are even close to being correct, that Galadriel and Halbrand arrived in Numenor approximately 38 days before the elves were ordered to leave Tirhad, which was when we first met them. Why am I highlighting this? Well, because it makes blatantly clear the incredible contrivance of having the Numenorians depart for war a month prior, only to then not actually be needed 
until the day they arrive. Had they arrived a week earlier, they would have arrived before Horden was even destroyed. Because the show hasn't told us, we have no idea what the state of the Southlands was prior to the start of the show. When we first met the Southlanders in Tiharad, the orcs have wiped out Horden and presumably Halbrand's village, but how many villages there are in total we have no idea. The orcs are also digging holes and tunnels, but prior to Arendir and Bronwyn's discovery of the remains of Horden, they had evidently not done enough to get them noticed, as nonsensical as that is. So, the Numenorians arriving six months earlier or something results in… I have no idea, because the show hasn't established how long the orcs have been doing what they are doing. And if they had arrived a week later, the Southlands would have been wiped out. But anyway, they're here now due to insane levels of absurd luck. It almost doesn't feel fair at this point, but let's compare the Numenorians' last minute arrival to the Rohirrim arriving at the Pelennor Fields. To be clear here before I start, I am not arguing that it sucks because it isn't as good as The Lord of the Rings. I am using The Lord of the Rings as an example of cause and effect culminating in something fantastic to contrast with Rings of Power having utterly broken continuity that is built on contrivance and convenience, and thus is terrible. This scene in isolation might be cool, but the foundation it is constructed upon collapses with any amount of scrutiny. Anyway, in The Lord of the Rings, Denethor did not want to ask Rohan for aid. Gandalf and Pippin did so regardless. Denethor, Gandalf, and Pippin all have very well-established motivations for doing what they choose to do. Theoden then decided to answer Gondor's call, which in and of itself is a huge character moment for him. Gondor calls for aid! And Rohan will answer. We then see Rohan assembling their army, struggling to find the numbers, and making their way across the continent to Gondor. Meanwhile, Minas Tirith is besieged. The orcs have broken through the gate and entered the city. And then, Rohan arrives. Before explaining why this works, I will now explain what happened in Rings of Power. Chronologically, Galadriel and Halbrand arrived in Numenor by pure chance. Galadriel successfully convinced Numenor to rescue the Southlands because Elendil had shown her a scroll that was written by some guy that explained that Sauron plans to create a realm where evil will thrive, Halbrand's claim that his village in the Southlands was destroyed by the orcs, and the revelation that Halbrand is the heir to the throne of the Southlands. The only one of these three revelations that makes sense is Halbrand's claims about his village, and only then if the characters believe him. See my previous videos for full explanations as to why none of this works, but regardless, Galadriel manages to recruit Numenor's non existent Resistant army and they depart for Middle-earth. Whilst the Numenorians are en route, the Southlanders evacuate their villages for mostly unspecified reasons and congregate in Osterith again for unspecified reasons. The orcs then attack Osterith and Arendir brings the watchtower down upon them. The Southlanders then regroup in Tirharad and prepare their defences but are ultimately defeated and trapped within the tavern. Okay, that is what happened. Now, why does the Ride of the Rohirrim succeed where the Ride of Numenor does not? Gondor, or specifically Gandalf and Pippin, lit the beacons, thus asking for aid and making clear that help was urgently required. The Southlanders did no such thing. Rohan had a very clear and very justified reason for wanting to go to war. Numenor did not. Rohan had a clear and defined destination. Numenor did not. Rohan's arrival, whilst timely, is by no means contrived as they did not arrive at the last possible minute, and their journey to aid Gondor was heavily explained and the timeline is clear. The Numenorians conversely have arrived at the last possible minute to save the day. So I can therefore conclude definitively. The Numenorians' arrival to save the Southlanders is absurdly contrived, because it relies on Galadriel acquiring an army that does not exist to go to a war that has not actually started yet. She does so by leveraging information that was quite literally inserted into the story so as to make this happen, with zero further explanation or exploration. They arrive at exactly the right time and in exactly the right location when they have no information to go on. I can see why people like this scene, because at first glance it appears to be effective and definitely evokes a similar vibe to what is without a doubt one of the most iconic moments from the Peter Jackson trilogy. However, this scene is only able to happen because of unexplained MacGuffins and a heap of contrived nonsense. There never was much hope. Anyway, the orcs have now battered down the door to the tavern, presumably meaning that everyone inside is fucked. Arendir starts to fight them off, but they threaten to kill Theo and Bronwyn, and he backs down. Then Adar enters the tavern. Hopefully he has a good reason for not killing everyone, because he has had multiple opportunities to do so. Sunny kissed him as he hunted near. 
Okay, uh, all right. See, this is not a good reason. All Adar knows is that a boy has the evil sword, or had the evil sword. If we read between the lines a bit, we can assume that Waldreg may have told Adar that it is Theo that has the evil sword. This, however, raises the question once again of why Waldreg did not bring the evil sword with him when he defected. Anyway, if we assume that Adar knows that Theo has the evil sword, Arandir's response here is to take a leaf out of Elrond's book and confirm that he knows where it is when he had no reason to do so. Sure, if Arandir had said, What evil sword? I don't know what you're talking about. Adar may have then threatened Bronwyn, thus causing Arandir to cave, but Arandir doesn't even try to hide this. Arandir says that if Adar lets the villagers go, he will consider giving over the evil sword, and in response the orcs kill three randos. Adar then orders that they kill Bronwyn next, as presumably Waldreg told Adar about their relationship. Before Arandir is given the chance to consider what to do, Thea reveals to Adar the location of the evil sword, and the location of the evil sword is under the floor in the tavern. I can't, guys, I can't. This show is fracturing my brain. Why do they keep doing this? Why can't they make it through one scene without colossal fuck-ups? Arandir specifically said, Where will you hide it? No one must know. Meaning that only he knew where it was. I know that we see Theo watch Arandir leave with it, which I have to assume the writers considered to be a sufficient explanation, but unless Theo followed Arandir into the pub and watched him put it under the floor all without Arandir noticing, this is impossible. And where he chose to hide it was in the fucking pub. Bury it in the woods, throw it in a lake, tie it to a squirrel, do anything other than take it to exactly where you know Adar is going to be. And whilst I don't take issue with Theo deciding to cave into Adar's demands to save his mother's life, this relies entirely on Arandir hiding the evil sword in the tavern and Theo being aware of this. We already know that this hilt does not function like the One Ring. It does not seem to have a will of its own. You are not drawn to its evilness or anything. It could have been far more effective and far more narratively coherent to have Theo plead with Arandir to reveal where he hid the evil sword in order to save his mother, and this being what eventually causes Arandir to cave. Anyway, Adar then approaches Waldreg and says that he has a task for him. Soon, I assume, we will learn what the purpose of this thing is and why Adar wants it so desperately. However, I assume we will never learn why the Southlanders didn't just leave and take the evil sword with them. Okay, Arandir is terrible at keeping secrets and is terrible at hiding things. Before I can continue, we have yet another example of the writers screwing with time and space in order to accommodate visual presentation. If you recall, night fell upon the Southlands earlier in the episode, which prompted the orcs to attack the village under cover of night. By the time the Numenorians arrive, dawn is breaking. So, this means that the defectors attacking Tirharad, the subsequent cleanup from the orc archers, and healing Bronwyn inside the tavern took around eight hours. This doesn't work in the slightest. We didn't cut away at any point. You can't hand wave this with an off-screen time jump. We saw, in sequence, the defectors approaching the village, Bronwyn trapping them with the burning wheelbarrow, the Southlanders picking off some orcs with their archers and then charging them with sticks, Arandir's fight with Big Chungus, the short-lived victory, the orcs cleaning up with their archers, patching up Bronwyn, and the orcs breaking in and Adar acquiring the evil sword. The only place where you could say that possibly there is a gap in the timeline is when they are patching up Bronwyn, but this does not work unless we accept that it took hours for them to do this and that the orcs just kind of sat around for seven hours waiting politely. This entire sequence took almost exactly 20 minutes of screen time, and the way it is depicted means it must have also taken near enough 20 minutes in-universe. But anyway, it's daytime now, or at least dawn, so let's see if this affects the orcs. I'll give you a clue. It doesn't, because of course it doesn't. Pretty pathetic, huh? So the Numenorians charge into the village, which then causes the orcs to decide to slaughter the remaining Southlanders. I have no idea how many are actually still alive, but given that they are all contained within a pub, and given that there are more orcs than people inside this pub, my guess would be no more than 20. So the orcs start killing the Southlanders, and because the show cuts away, we just have to kind of accept that some of them survive, specifically Arandir, Theo, and Bronwyn, even though they are vastly outnumbered by a much stronger species within a confined space. Meanwhile, outside, the Numenorians mow down the orcs by using chains tied between their horses. As they ride in opposite directions, the chains get longer and longer, meaning each rider must have had a large bundle of chain that they were either holding or was attached to their horse. Either way, this seems like a rather risky move, but it, it looks cool. 
fine. Harrandir and Theo leave the tavern and start killing orcs, which can only mean that not only did the orcs not kill everyone inside the tavern, but that in actuality the Southlanders killed every single orc that was inside the tavern. We have to assume this, because if not, then Arendir and Theo have just left a bedridden Bronwyn inside a pub full of orcs. And as if it even needs saying at this point, I don't believe that they could have done this. Again, you can't really tell, but I think an estimate of 20-odd Southlanders seems about right, which includes the wounded and the children. Similarly, we can't be exact with the number of orcs, but we saw at least 20 approaching the door. Which means if I am being as generous as possible, the show is telling us that an assortment of 19 humans, including wounded, elderly, and children, plus Arendir, was able to defeat 20 orcs. I do not believe you. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Now we get to the moment that has been thoroughly mocked, and I am in two minds about it. Firstly, I will just show you what happens. <laughs> So, Galadriel demonstrates incredible reaction time and agility, catches this orc off guard, and decapitates him. I am going to present all sides to this that I can think of, and then conclude on whether or not this is a problem. I have seen people criticize this scene by saying that Galadriel is showing off, and that it looks ridiculous, and that it is not an efficient way to dodge an arrow and decapitate an orc. I have also seen people defend this by saying something along the lines of, well it was okay when Legolas did it, so stop being a misogynist. So, in universe, I take zero issues with Galadriel being able to do this. She is insanely agile and has crazy elven reflexes, etc, etc. Whether or not this was the most efficient way to do what she was trying to do, I have no idea because I don't know anything about horse riding. Although my gut instinct tells me that this was unnecessary, she likely could have just leaned slightly to the left. I do, however, think that the Legolas comparison allows us to narrow down the exact reason why this scene is pissing people off. Legolas, like Galadriel, is thousands of years old and is an expert in martial combat. They both have superhuman agility, balance, reactions, and to a lesser degree strength. There are four examples that I can point to of Legolas using his superhuman elven abilities in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I am ignoring the Hobbit movies because I've only seen those movies once and I don't care to see them again. The first example is during the cave troll fight, whereby Legolas performs some pretty incredible moves leading to the troll's defeat. The second example is him doing this crazy flip onto his horse during the warg attack. The third example is him surfing on the shield, and the fourth example is him bringing down a mummer kill single-handedly. So, was Legolas showing off in any of these examples? In the scene with the cave troll, the answer is a categorical no. Legolas was cooperating with the other members of the Fellowship in a manner that was consistent with each of their skill sets. Legolas may have dealt the killing blow, but he could not have done this without them. In the case of the horse flip, I would also argue no, because it allowed him to get back on his horse without the horse stopping, which would have put people at risk. Yes, it looks showboaty, but it serves a practical purpose and I have no issues with Legolas being able to do this. In the case of the shield surfing, this one is a little harder to defend, but him choosing to surf down the stairs on the shield allows him to get to Gimli and Aragorn quickly, whilst also being able to use his bow and remain a hard target for the Uruks. In the case of him bringing down the Mummerkill, this is pretty explicitly depicted as him showing off to a degree, given Gimli's response. That still only counts as one! However, this is by no means a problem, because he firstly successfully brought down a goddamn mama kill, and secondly he did it efficiently. Gimli's perception that Legolas was showing off is a natural result of Legolas' ability to do these incredible things, and it is acknowledged in-universe. So, to bring this point back round to the scene in question, what Galadriel does here is probably most directly comparable to the shield surfing scene. In both cases, what they are each doing is acceptable in-universe and serves some kind of purpose, so isn't being done purely to say, look what I can do. So, why is Rule of Cool a valid defense for Legolas surfing on the shield, but not for Galadriel doing an upside-down orc decapitation? One difference between these two scenes is that Galadriel's move was entirely self-serving, whereas Legolas was trying to reach Aragorn and Gimli. Most critically, however, the reason I think people like the Legolas scene and do not like the Galadriel scene is because she's a woman- no. Is because people like Legolas and people do not like Galadriel. I believe that if this scene were taking place in Osterith and Galadriel had pulled the exact same move as Legolas, people would still have a problem with it, not because of the move itself, but because of the character in question. I am not going to list all the references I have for this next statement, but if you want them, then check out the previous videos in this series. Galadriel is both a terrible person and a terribly written character that the show consistently and repeatedly tries to depict as awesome, admirable, and an aspirational badass. 
This inherent contradiction means that scenes like this feel like the writers are reaching through the TV to grab you by the throat and yell, you will enjoy Galadriel, look, she's so awesome. This, of course, could not be further from Legolas's character in The Lord of the Rings. Yes, he is awesome, but he's also not a one-dimensional selfish dick that the show thinks is awesome. Anyway, back to the other characters. We see Ontamo, Isildur's other buddy, being attacked by an orc. The orc pulls him off his horse and strikes repeatedly at his sword no fewer than ten times. Seriously, count them. <laughs> suggesting that the orc in fact did not want to actually kill Ontamo. A stabbing motion might have been more effective. Stab, twist, gut. But I guess the orcs are just a wee bit special when it comes to attacking named characters. Which reminds me, are the Numenorians actually heeding Galadriel's advice on how best to kill an orc? Well, Afrox stabbed and twisted this guy, but this was his chest, not, not his gut. Can you gut someone in the sternum? I, I don't think so, but props for trying. It is also worth noting here that the Numenorians are, as established previously, not militaristic. Eleven days ago, they did not have an army. These guys are defeating orcs, having never fought or seen an orc before. It has also been heavily implied that the orcs are stronger than men, so it is reasonable to assume that they are more competent fighters in a 1v1. But then, actually, Bronwyn totally slayed that one orc earlier, Yas Queen, so my assumptions are apparently built on a foundation of ass gravy. We then see Muriel and Isildur up on a cliff, uh, I, I guess Isildur is done shoveling shit and he's now a soldier, I guess? And she tells him to go on his own, apparently. Not entirely sure why Muriel told Isildur to just go, but I guess it will facilitate whatever comes next. Speaking of, we then see Elendil getting gangbanged by some orcs while Isildur rides into the village. Elendil is saved not by Isildur, but by Halbrand, which I definitely prefer to him being saved by Isildur. I guess we will have to keep waiting to see why they decided to turn Elendil into Cork, the mentally challenged crime sleuth. We're all out of leads, Cork. What do you make of the situation? <laughs> I'm a tornado! I'm a tornado! I'm a <laughs> anyway, Isildur reaches his father, who assures him that he is okay. Galadriel then approaches Arendir and asks where the orc commander is. Arendir points out Adar and says that he must not escape with the evil sword. So, a few things here. Firstly, as we can assume, Adar does not in fact have the evil sword because he approached Waldreg and presumably he gave it to him. Evidently, Arendir is unaware of this fact. If I was a nitpicker, I would suggest that given that Arendir is meant to have super acute hearing, he should have heard Adar when he left the tavern and said, Waldreg, I have a task for you. I can let this slide though because this marks the fourth explicit reference to Arendir not having heightened senses, so again, until they tell me that he does in fact have superhuman senses, I will be content to simply accept this fact. Secondly, how the fuck did Waldreg get out of Tirharad? Adar approaches him and then immediately the village is swarmed by the Numenorean cavalry. I know that not everything needs explaining, but whatever Adar's task is that requires Waldreg to take the evil sword somewhere hinges entirely on him being able to get out of Tirharad, which given the circumstances should be nearly impossible. Anyway, Theo appears to admire Galadriel, asking Arendir who she is, and Arendir indicates that he is aware of who she is, stating that she is commander of the Northern Armies. Sorry buddy, you missed a couple. She's also the warrior of the wastelands, and she's also the scourge of the orcs. Very quick tangent, I promise. I find it hilarious that Galadriel's titles in Rings of Power are all uber badass non-feminine military titles, whereas her titles in The Lord of the Rings are Lady of Light, Lady of Lorien, Lady of the Wood, and Mistress of Magic, which are all of course extremely feminine. I wonder why they did that! Anyway, Galadriel pursues Adar on horseback, which Halbrand notices. After a bit of a chase, Halbrand brings down Adar's horse, although how he knew where Adar was going and how he caught up with them is a mystery. Adar then reaches for the- oh wait, so I guess he didn't actually give the evil sword to Waldreg. Either that or the writers think I'm an idiot. Wait, hold on. Hold the fuck on. Are they going to reveal that this is not the real evil sword? The writers of course want us to believe that it is in fact the evil sword. The evidence for it being the evil sword is substantial, as the village was attacked whilst Adar was in the process of telling Waldreg to go and do a thing. So there is a reasonable likelihood that Adar would have instead kept the evil sword in order to protect it. For this to in fact not be the evil sword requires that Adar did in fact give the sword to Waldreg the moment the Numenorians attacked, that he managed to explain to Waldreg what specifically he needed to do in the seconds he had before being hit by a cavalry charge, and that Waldreg managed to survive and take it wherever he ends up taking it, which is an extremely risky plan on Adar's part. All of this means that the quote unquote twist of Waldreg having the real sword and not Adar requires that we accept something that makes less sense than what we were initially led to believe. This is not how twists work. A twist will typically act as a reversal of pre-established material in order to shock or surprise the audience in a way that they may not have seen coming, but critically, in a way that makes sense. 
The new information that serves as the twist cannot be something that makes less sense than what was originally implied. In Fight Club, the revelation as to the true relationship between Tyler Durden and the narrator makes substantially more sense than that Tyler was just some rando that he met that one time. In Shutter Island, the revelation as to Teddy's true nature makes substantially more sense than what we were originally led to believe. In The Prestige, the revelation as to how Borden and Angier actually performed their tricks makes the entire film function, because it is probably the only explanation that does in fact make any sense. In Rings of Power, the only way anyone can truly believe that Waldreg has the evil sword is if they subconsciously accept that Adar gave him the sword and explained his evil plan whilst the Numenorians were charging them, and then that he managed to get out of Tiharad in one piece during a cavalry charge. Alrighty then. Anyway, Halbrand skewers Adar's hand and asks if he remembers him. Adar says that he does not, and Halbrand prepares to kill him before Galadriel stops him, saying that she needs him alive. Adar begins to taunt Halbrand. Did I cause someone you love pain? A woman? Perhaps a child? Causing Galadriel to tell him to shut up in the most eloquent way possible that is certainly befitting a character of her demeanor. Eat your tongue. We then get yet another strange nonsense metaphor. One cannot satisfy thirst by drinking seawater. God damn it. What does this mean? Why do you think this is clever? You can't just spit out nonsense and pretend it's meaningful and any approximation of Tolkien's dialogue. All right, okay, let's stick on this for a second. One cannot satisfy thirst by drinking seawater. I think, given the circumstances, that Galadriel is saying killing him won't bring you peace. Halbrand is thirsty for vengeance and killing Adar would be seawater. I'm, I'm doing my best here, I swear. So let's come up with some similar lines. One cannot have a satisfying poo if they have diarrhea. One cannot clean their house if they use aspic. One cannot drive to work if they fill their car up with mouthwash. One cannot make a phone call if their phone is an antelope. One cannot get drunk by drinking napalm. This shit isn't clever, it is retarded and anyone can do it. Stop pretending to be clever, it is not nice to lie. Okay, so Halbrand has some kind of personal grievance with Adar, and Adar does not value his own life. We then return to the village and see that the Numenorians have won seemingly without many or possibly any losses. Afrok tells Isildur that both of them will be leaving soon to hunt down any orcs that escaped. We then see Galadriel interrogating Adar. I assume that the cloth wrapping containing what is definitely the evil sword and definitely not anything else has been properly examined, and the reason I say this so smugly is because I know that they abso fucking lutely have not done this. Galadriel deduces that Adar is an elf that was tortured by Morgoth and became one of the first orcs. She then asks him where Sauron is. Adar does not cooperate, and Galadriel threatens to bring the orc prisoners into the sunlight. Oh yeah, I'd forgotten that orcs burn when in the sun. I guess this right here doesn't count as sunlight. Anyway, Adar explains that Sauron intended to heal Middle-earth after Morgoth was defeated. He says that Sauron sought to create a power over flesh, and we see a flashback to the fortress in Foradwaith from episode 1. Turns out that Sauron sacrificed orcs in order to reveal dark knowledge, but was unsuccessful. Adar did not approve due to Sauron killing the orcs whom Adar considers to be his children, and so he killed Sauron. Galadriel, of course, does not believe this, and to convey this, she says, I do not believe you. Man, the writing of this show sure is eloquent, isn't it? These characters just say exactly what they are thinking in the simplest way possible. Well, unless it's metaphor time. Anyway, Galadriel then says that she considers the orcs to not be children, but slaves, which is an interesting thing to say given that the orcs, as depicted in Rings of Power, appear to be more than willing to do everything that they do. Adar responds, They are not children, they are slaves. But each one has a name, heart. The heart created by Morgoth. We are creations of the one. Master of the secret fire, the same as you. Is worthy of the breath of life, and just as worthy of a home. So this pretty much confirms Adar's motivation throughout the series. He truly believes that orcs are just like any other species of Middle-earth and thus deserve a home, even though orcs are, without exception, evil. Even though every single action the orcs have taken in these six episodes has been evil. It may have been more interesting to have Adar be far more morally ambiguous and to maybe have him disapprove of the orcs killing indiscriminately, as he wants them to be better than their nature. They could have had a degree of complexity here, but no, Adar is just as evil as the orcs, albeit less animalistic. Anyway, then Galadriel says, Your kind was a mistake. Made in mockery 
And even if it takes me all of this age, I vow to eradicate every last one of you. Okay, so, orcs were created by Morgoth, they are inherently and necessarily evil, Wiping them out seems like a good idea which I'm on board with. However, Galadriel has literally just said that she views them as slaves, suggesting that she does not consider them to have any agency in what they are actually doing. This also makes her Galadriel of the Noldor, daughter of the Golden House of Finarfin, commander of the Northern Armies, Scourge of the Orcs, Warrior of the Wastelands, and Genocider of Slaves. Galadriel then continues, You shall be kept alive, so that one day, before I drive my dagger into your poisoned heart, I will whisper in your piked ear that all your offspring are dead and the scourge of your kind ends with you. Holy shit, woman. It is one thing to wipe out all the orcs because they are beings of pure evil. It is quite another to torture Adar for presumably hundreds of years so that you can keep him alive and aware of the fact that you are utterly annihilating every single thing that he loves and cares about. You are a fucking monster. I'm gonna say something spicy now, which I know is slightly off-brand. But here we go. Adar is a better person than Galadriel. Adar cares deeply for the orcs and wants them to have a home. He is willing to threaten and kill people to achieve this. Galadriel has little regard for her own life or the lives of her companions, is willing to threaten murder to get what she wants, is planning a genocide and considers centuries of pointless torture to be not only acceptable, but desirable. Both Adar and Galadriel have questionable methods, but Adar very much cares about those around him, whereas we are repeatedly shown that Galadriel explicitly only cares about herself. A tempest in Adar is a better person than Galadriel. I'm honestly rooting for Adar here. Once again, congratulations to the writers of Rings of Power. Your villain is a substantially more sympathetic character than your hero. And no, you did not do this deliberately. This is not some clever subversion, this is incompetence. I won't elaborate further for now, but I will be covering this concept when I do my end of series autopsy. Anyway, Adar observes that Galadriel is pretty fucking disgusting, and she replies, Perhaps your search for Morgoth's successor should have ended in your own mirror. Perhaps I shall begin by killing you. I have no further comment on this beyond what I already said. She moves to kill Adar and Halbrand stops her, revealing that he was present for this entire scene and thus knows what both characters just said to each other. As they leave, Adar asks Halbrand who he is, and he does not answer. Hmm, I wonder. Okay, so Adar cares deeply for the orcs, and Galadriel is morally okay with genocide cannot control her emotions, is willing to torture someone to get what she wants, and is willing to go out of her way to torture someone for no reason. We then follow Galadriel and Halbrand outside, and she thanks him for stopping her from killing Adar. Halbrand says that after having fought at Galadriel's side, he thinks he has achieved a degree of peace. So it turns out that not only was Galadriel absolutely correct when she told Halbrand that he won't find peace in Numenor whilst manipulating him into doing what she wants, but also that Galadriel herself is specifically the thing that gave Halbrand peace. She is such a good person, guys. So inspiring and totally not a contemptible piece of work. She then responds that she also felt that special feeling from fighting alongside Halbrand, and they lock eyes romantically. So, she is gonna ride on Sauron's meat scepter, isn't she? Before she can, however, Halbrand is called to see the Queen Regent. We then see that the surviving Southlanders and Numenorians are drinking and chatting, and I'm sorry, did a battle not literally just take place here? This place looks brand new. They didn't even try. There is no damage to anything. There are no bodies. There is no blood. Did they film this scene before trashing the set to film the battle scene? Did they think no one would notice? Did they just not care? I have no fucking idea. We also see that Bronwyn is up and running again. I guess those seeds must contain some ungodly cocktail of methamphetamine crack and monster energy. Anyway, she thanks Muriel and says her people are alive because of her. Indeed, darling, she saw a sign from the gods and set sail over a month before you even knew anything remotely orky was going on. Actually, if we think about this a little deeper, Muriel was convinced by Galadriel that the orcs were taking over the Southlands and were an imminent threat to the rest of Middle-earth, presumably including Numenor. She assembled an army and sailed across the ocean to wipe them out and sit Halbrand on the throne. Having arrived, the Numenorians have killed, what, 50 orcs? Maybe a hundred? Shouldn't she be furious that Galadriel was wrong? I know their timely arrival did indeed save the remaining Southlanders, all 20 of them, but Muriel did not travel across the world to save 20 people. She came to wipe out the orcs. I guess it is a good thing too that they only needed 500 soldiers. Anyway, Muriel then replies that as she understands it, the Southlanders are alive because of Bronwyn. A burden I never sought to take up. What? What? Yes, you fucking did. 
Who gave you the right to decide? Everyone who decided to come to this tower, Waldrick, including you. You just decided that you were in charge and no one stopped you. Few of the finest leaders do. Muriel is the queen because she is the daughter of the king. How the two of you came into your respective roles as strong independent- Sorry, I mean your two roles as totally competent leaders is not comparable whatsoever. After thoroughly congratulating each other for being totally amazing and the saviors of all, Muriel introduces Bronwyn to Halbrand, revealing that he is their promised king. Is it true? Are you the king we were promised? Yes. Yeah, they don't know who Halbrand is. He is some guy with a thing who says that he is the king. They don't have any reason to accept him other than that he looks somewhat authoritative. A quick reminder that the method by which Halbrand was convinced to assume this role is utter nonsense, full explanation in my coverage of episode 5. Anyway, the survivors salute King Halbrand, given that there were maybe 20 people in that tavern, and you know what, fuck it, let's just say all 20 of them survived. The Southlands, Halbrand's kingdom, consists of 20 people. Are there more? We don't have any reason to believe there are more. Everyone was at Osterith, and everyone from Osterith either defected or came here. But yeah, woo, Halbrand is the king, woo, this goddamn show. Theo and Arendir then have a chat, and Arendir tells Theo to not feel bad about giving up the evil sword to Adar. Theo then tells us exactly what he feels, because rule number four for writing Rings of Power is to have your characters say exactly what they are thinking. It's not just guilt, I feel. It's loss. Loss? When it was in my hands, I felt powerful. Theo explains that he felt powerful when he held the evil sword. Arendir then hands Theo the evil sword and says he should rid himself of its power by giving it to the Numenorians to toss into the sea on their way home. And he then leaves. That's a damn stupid thing to do. A few quick things. Theo has just told Arendir that the evil sword makes him feel powerful. It clearly has some kind of one ring type effect on him, or perhaps on people in general. So Arendir gives it to him. This seems wildly irresponsible, but all right. Also, dropping the evil sword into the ocean seems like as good a way to get rid of it as any, as it apparently can't be destroyed and also does not have any kind of one ring-like will of its own. However, Arendir has just given the super secret evil MacGuffin to a child, which means he is the second character to have done this. Anyway, oh boy guys, it's coming. Prepare thine selves. Theo unwraps the hitherto undisclosed cloth wrapping contain- oh, yeah, it's not there. Whoops. These people, as if we needed any further evidence, are incomprehensibly unintelligent. I will place the blame specifically on Galadriel and Arendir. Arendir tells Galadriel that- Galadriel then captures Adar and does not check to see what is contained within the mystery cloth wrapping. Okay, maybe Galadriel is so hell-bent on threatening genocide and centuries of mental torment to be bothered by this, but Arendir has no such excuse. He should have been on this the fucking second that he saw Galadriel return. So Galadriel is an idiot, and Arendir is an idiot. We then see that Waldreg, the crafty creepster, did manage to get out of Tirhad. He also has the evil sword with him, meaning that Adar did in fact give it to Waldreg, who to him is just some rando that kills people when you ask nicely. Adar apparently does not respect Waldreg even after he kills Captain Racism because he seems to completely ignore him. Meaning no offence, Lord Father, but where is he? What happened to Sauron? But oh well, character consistency, yada yada. So what happens next is Waldreg drives the sword into a hole in the ground in Osterith, which we had seen in episode 5, although it was still unknown what it did. As a result of this, the dam opens at Osterith and the lake floods out. As a result of this, water begins to explode out of the ground in Tirharad. We see that the water is rushing through the tunnels and down the trench that the orcs had been digging. We see that the trench is heading towards this mountain. It turns out that this is in fact not a mountain, it is a volcano. The water pours into the volcano and causes it to erupt. As this is happening, Elendil rushes to protect the queen, Isildur to protect his horse, Ontamo to find Afrok, and Arendir and Bronwyn to find Theo. Galadriel, meanwhile, stands motionless, staring down the oncoming cloud of volcanic matter as it engulfs her, and the credits roll. I am struggling to find the words. I don't know how to explain sufficiently why this is so awful. I am speechless. Hold on, I need a minute. No! 
right, let's do this. There is a volcano here now. Of course, I already knew this because I am familiar with the Lord of the Rings. Rings of Power, however, has not communicated this, meaning that the revelation that this is a volcano comes out of fucking nowhere. There are zero references to it being a volcano in the entire six hours of runtime so far. I am not a geologist, so my understanding of how volcanoes work is very rudimentary. As I understand it, if water enters a volcano, the water will be superheated and will thus become gas. As gas occupies more space than a liquid, this leads to increased pressure inside the volcano, which then leads to the contents of the volcano spewing out of the top. What we saw was water pouring in through a hole into a vast empty chamber which then caused the volcano to turn into a thermonuclear bomb. Adding water to a volcano does not do this. There is no pressure inside this giant empty chamber. This isn't how this works. And the result of this is that the volcano annihilates everything nearby. I know I'm jumping ahead slightly because I haven't yet seen episode 7 or 8, so the only person I know survives is Galadriel. But regardless, had the show cut away and not explicitly shown us the ash cloud of superheated volcanic matter consuming Tiharad, then I would have had serious questions as to how the hell anything survived. Because this show wanted the cool shot of Gladriel facing down a pyroclastic flow, this has made this problem even worse. We see explicitly what happens, there is no ambiguity for the writers to hide behind. There is no question, Galadriel is dead, as are the remaining Southlanders, the surviving Orcs, Adar, the Numenorians. everyone is dead. You can survive jumping into the ocean, provided you accidentally cross paths with a couple of rescue boats. You cannot survive this. This shit is literally a thousand degrees, if not more. Being anywhere near this will liquefy you. What we have just seen is Galadriel get shot in the face and yet miraculously survive. There are now no stakes because characters can survive impossible things. But random, the show has already established that evil fire is not hot. Don't give me that shit, retarded alter ego. You can't have it both ways. If the contents of the volcano were not hot, then it would not have erupted. Not that it should have erupted anyway, but you get my point. This scene is probably the most absurd scene in the series so far because it only happens due to multiple conveniences and contrivances and utter disregard for basic physics and incredible levels of plot armor. Okay, so usually at this point I do an overall breakdown of each plot thread to work out how the writers bent time and space in order to achieve their goals, but as episode 6 consists entirely of one single plot line, I will instead have a look at Adar's plan now that it has been revealed in full. Adar first needed to acquire orcs. Luckily the Southlands is full of orcs, so we're good to go. Then Adar needs to start digging the trench from Mount Doom to Osterith. Because orcs can't work during the day, unless of course you give them a hat or the writers forget, Adar needed to speed things up a bit by acquiring some slave labour. He has the orcs tunnel underneath the various villages of the Southlands so as to abduct their populaces. Now, critically, this is a mission of stealth. Because if Adar and the orcs get caught early, then the whole thing falls apart. So, in order to avoid being seen, the orcs have to quietly burn down the villages that they raided, so that no one notices that they're gone, and they also have to rip down every tree near them to turn the Southlands into a barren hellscape, which will of course mean that no one is able to see them. After all, the unseen giant evil trench is the deadliest. Now, in order to actually open the dam, Adar needs to acquire the evil sword. He knows about this because shut up and don't think about it. Luckily for him, a child was seen in one of the villages carrying it. Luckily for him, this child was in the village because the adults had forgotten to bring any food with them when they evacuated. So this is really their fault. Had this not happened, Adar would not know where the evil sword is. Anyway, unable to believe his luck that some kid just popped up out of nowhere with the evil sword and is now known to be in Osterith, Adar attacks the Southlanders first at Osterith and then at Tiharad. He acquires the evil sword by threatening to kill people and gives it to Waldreg. As a distraction, Adar will need to grab an axe and wrap it up to disguise it as the evil sword so that the Southlanders waste their time chasing the wrong MacGuffin. Adar is aware of how profoundly unintelligent the Southlanders are after observing them forgetting to bring any food with them during an evacuation, so he is confident that they will not actually check to see if the decoy is in fact the real thing until it is too late. Meanwhile, Waldreg will then be able to escape an active battlefield unharmed, return to Osterith, insert the evil sword into the keyhole, and open the dam. This will cause the contents of the lake to spill out into the trench, into the volcano, and thus cause the volcano to erupt. Well done, Adar. As a result of the volcano erupting, the orcs now have a home, I think. Well then, it's question time. Who made the evil sword? We can assume Sauron due to the mark of Sa oh no, sorry, due to the map of the Southlands being engraved on it. Why did Sauron make an evil sword to open a dam? Did he add this to Osterith? Did he build Osterith? I was under the impression that Osterith was built by the elves, but I could be wrong here. How does Adar know about all this? Why did Waldrake have the evil sword at the beginning of the series? Why did Adar wait until now to start building the trenches? Why was the trench not built thousands of years prior when the evil sword was made? Why did the elves who were previously in Osterith for 67 years not notice this giant trench slowly being dug alongside all the deforestation? Why does exploding a volcano mean that orcs now have a home? Is it just going to block out the sun forever? 
I'm not even going to summarize this. I honestly think this speaks for itself. Okay, so that brings us to the end of episode 6 of Rings of Power. In this episode, we had more absurdly convoluted and nonsensical plans. We had incredible levels of plot armor. We had a plot driven entirely by bending time and space, relying on uninhibited luck, and characters knowing things that they cannot know or doing things that they would not do. And it ends with a moment so utterly ridiculous, it is quite simply laughable. The significant amount of time spent in episode 5 jumping through cognitive hoops in order to let Isildur join the army also has not paid off yet so I'm assuming this will come later. If not, then a substantial chunk of episode 5 was spent wasting our time, getting Isildur a spot in the army via ruining characters for no reason. So, the big question I have is, why did people who did not like episodes 1-5 to five like this episode? Well, as long as you only absorb the purely superficial elements, episode 6 of Rings of Power has big action, big character moments, and big emotional payoffs. Unfortunately, the action scenes are mostly okay in isolation but are built on nonsense. The big character moments and the emotional payoffs include Bronwyn and Arendir finally embracing their romance, discovering that they had killed their own people, Bronwyn being badly wounded, the Numenorians arriving heroically just in time, Galadriel chasing Adar, Halbrand nearly getting his revenge, Galadriel and Halbrand bonding emotionally, Bronwyn and the Southlanders cheering for their lost king who has finally returned, and the final moments where Adar ultimately achieves his goal and Mount Doom erupts and destroys all in its path. When I put it like that, it sounds pretty cool. If I gave this summary to someone who was interested in watching the show, they may well say, oh wow, that sounds pretty awesome, I can't wait to see all that. The problem with the episode, and the show in general, is not the broad strokes of what happens. The problem is how and why the show makes these things happen. In a good show, this kind of thing would have been pretty cool, no doubt, but very little of it works at all. Probably the best scene in the episode is the one between Arendir and Bronwyn before the battle, but even that relies on nonsense for these two characters to even be present. This entire show has pretty much become a perfect example of bad writing, and I will never understand why anyone actually thinks otherwise. Give me some examples of it being badly written, they say. Well, by the time I finish this series I'll have at least 10 hours of that. Can you give me one example of it being well written? Because so far in these first six episodes, and after over six hours of analysis, I have identified two scenes that I think are well written and a third which I honestly think happened by accident. Overall, episode 6 is absolutely not the best episode of the series. I would probably give that award to episode 2. Is episode 6 the worst? Probably not. Without thinking about it too much, I'd say episodes 3 and 5 and maybe 4 are all worse. But at this point, it rather seems like comparing the state of the toilet bowl after I eat a vindaloo versus after I drink drain cleaner. Thank you guys so much for watching, please do consider sharing, liking, or subscribing because, again, it is extremely motivating for me to actually get these videos out. By the time I upload this video it will have been nearly two weeks since I uploaded part 5, and since then my channel has broken 500 subs and has also broken 1000 subs, which I again never expected that so many people would be enjoying my Rings of Power content. As always, if you have any comments, if you agree with me or disagree, if you think I missed something or got something wrong, please do leave a comment because I do read all of my comments. Thank you again, and I will see you in my next video.